to introduce Nadav Hockman. Um, he is an associate director of Gray Area Foundation for the Arts and San Francisco's premier center for promoting the intersection of art, technology, and community uh, for social and civic impact. Through public events, uh, education and incubation, Gray Area convenes practitioners in the arts, sciences, technology, and humanities uh, to share knowledge, forge connections, and generate holistic insights that lead to a better understanding of complex challenges. Prior to joining Gray Area, Hockman was the co-founder, co-founding director of the Arts and Tech Initiative at the Tech Museum of Innovation, Silicon Valley's leading science and technology cultural institution. Serving over 500,000 visitors each year, the program facilitated creative collaborations between global artists, designers, major local tech companies and research institutions. The initiative's work has been exhibited worldwide and celebrated at South by Southwest and commissioned by international institutions and festivals such as Ars Electronica and Art Science Museum. In his previous doctoral research position at the University of Pittsburgh and CUNYU, Hockman led the development of an award-winning big data visualization projects, merging conceptual methods with humanistic approaches. This work has been exhibited at IMOMA in New York City, Google Zeitgeist, ZKM Center for Art and Media, and featured in hundreds of kind of media outlets such as Popular Science, The Atlantic, Wired, and The Guardian. So without further ado, really excited to kind of hear uh, more about uh, Nadav's work with the gray area. Um, so I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Alessandro, um, Laura, Emily, John, and really the entire team um, for putting together this wonderful and important conference, uh, and including me as part of it. Um, I will uh, uh, jump right to it and start sharing my presentation. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. So I'd like to start um, with the title, uh, as Alessandro just said in his kind intro, um, with the title of this concluding session of the conference, um, which is STEAM collaboration through community. And ask maybe um, the obvious question, um, of what do we even mean? What do we really mean by a 21st century community? I, for example, uh, I grew up in a socialist commune in Israel uh, in the 1980s um, called the kibbutz. Uh, some of you may have heard of it. Um, and what it means is basically a group of several hundred of people, so a very small group of uh, small community uh, who all work together uh, for the benefit of the entire community, uh, and they all share their properties uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, and profits uh, equally for the benefits of the commune, right? Um, and in normal days, it looks pretty similar to the image on the right. Uh, this one is from 1936, uh, but I can attest to the fact that it hasn't changed much since. Uh, but this example is, I assume, is a bit extreme. Uh, um, and I don't think that that's what we all mean um, by a community in this context, uh, at least not in this conference. So what is it, right? Um, is it a community of people that shares this, the same location and needs uh, and come together around uh, shared goals? Or is it what we usually call a community of practice or interest? a more general group of people um, who share a common concern, a set of problems, uh, or an interest in a topic? It's a hard question, um, and, and, and we'll see more about it later on in this presentation and, and the rest of this discussion, especially when it comes to the work of place-based cultural organizations, um, which are involved in STEAM practices. Since this organization's mission, right, uh, is to serve the local community as a cultural community center, um, but they do so uh, by collaborating with uh, um, global communities, right, such as the global creative community, the global create community of uh, uh, digital artists, or the global community of the tech sector, and so on and so forth. Uh, so all of that 
is to remind us that uh, STEAM collaborations are highly, highly contextual. Um, and they are contextual because we are working with different types of communities, with different types of needs and wants, right? Um, and, it's, and it is this context and specific need uh, that make the work, the collab collaborative work through community um, impactful. Um, and it's not the creation of new shiny objects. And, and, and I thought it was important to emphasize that uh, as we move forward, um, um, because these two elements uh, tend to be con conflated by many. Um, so I took the opportunity of this session really, um, and I'm happy about it. Um, thank you again for inviting me uh, to really reflect on the question of STEAM collaboration through community in different contexts. Um, through my own practice in the past decade, um, investigating ways to achieve what I hope is meaningful collaborations between different and oftentimes quite intellectually and culturally different sectors through STEAM practices, uh, moving from academic research, academic work to my more recent work in, in science museums, science and technology centers, uh, and uh, currently in arts-driven institutions. So let's jump right to it. I want to take you back to uh, 2011. Um, it's been a few years already uh, when a new app called Instagram, um, you may have heard of it. Uh, it wasn't that uh, uh, long of a time ago when, when they just showed up. Um, so it was in 2011 when, when Instagram started to gain popularity among uh, the global hipster community, right? Um, and at the same time, while they were gaining this uh, immense popularity, um, they also decided to open an API. Um, API, as you, I assume all of you know, is an application programming interface, uh, which allows third-party application to build on top of, in this case, Instagram. And it also allowed these developers um, access to users' photos uh, and information. Now, from a research point of view, what it meant was that for the first time, we had access to millions of photos from around the world, uh, including information such as uh, photos metadata, such as location, obviously, time, timestamps, aesthetic choices, such as which filter uh, was being used for what purposes. And from a research point of view, it was uh, a first of its kind uh, opportunity to examine visual culture from a comparative perspective on a global scale, right? Just consider the sheer number of users and availability of the data uh, at the time. Now, the problem was that in order to tackle this unique research opportunity, and you know, for me personally, uh, it was astonishing and, and, uh, of what, what you could have done with this type of new um, uh, scale of data from so many different users from so many different places. But really to understand what we can do with it, we need new tools, uh, new questions uh, in perspective that really uh, didn't really exist yet, um, both on the symbolic, educational, intellectual, and practical levels. Uh, we had none of these really. Um, so what do you do? Um, I worked with, I collaborated with Lev Manovich um, and his team from uh, the Cultural Analytics Lab. Uh, Back then it was in UC San Diego and then it moved to CUNY in New York City. Um, and we assembled a group of uh, art historians, social scientists, engineers, artists, and designers. Uh, so a very wide range, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, whatever you want to call it, a group of people. Um, and we developed uh, a set of projects that use this uh, immense data set of millions of Instagram photos to study cultural differences and trends around the world. Um, so we developed, as you can see in the video behind me, um, we developed a set of techniques that sorted large sets of photos in different layouts. Uh, and we then analyzed these visualizations in order to find patterns uh, in the data. Um, now, unfortunately, I don't have time to go too much uh, uh, into too much detail, 
Uh, but we had a lot of fun, uh, as you can see, uh, playing with the tools and data and comparing millions of photos from different locations. Uh, for example, we compared uh, New York City and Tokyo around the same time period and saw the differences in content uh, in the amount of data that was taken. Uh, we also compared photos taking uh, in Centre Pompidou in Paris versus photos taking uh, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, and the results are really stunning um, and, 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 um, and I hope um, insightful. So I'm just gonna jump around a little bit to show you just a sheer range of, of visualizations that we've created. And you can really zoom in and out and explore the individual content of images and zoom, uh, uh, zoom out and see the entire collection as a whole. Now, the project continued for several years, right? We started in 2011, 2012, um, and we continued to work in on that for about three to five years, I think. Um, and we experimented with different types of data, such as selfies taken in different cities around the world. This project is called Selfie City, where we compared selfies taken, uh, taken in uh, five cities around the world and created visualization tools to um, allow people to play with the data set and create different data communities uh, that uh, uh, um, represent um, different attributes um, um, in the data. But speaking about communities in this context is interesting, and not only because we are working with online communities and trying to sort of visualize them through visual material, but also uh, from my perspective, uh, since it, it's interesting since uh, at the time, as I mentioned, art historians, or let's speak more broadly about the visual culture research community, right? Um, they both fall into the category of this more traditional humanistic research. Um, for whom we hope this research, this research project will really unveil new tools and methods, new data sets, um, and really open up new questions to support their research. Um, so in that sense, the project was an illustration of an urgent need uh, that the community itself was maybe not aware of, or was definitely, most of it was definitely more not aware of, um, of really an existing community, um, uh, it was a need to call, we called the community to come together around this um, and discuss its research needs uh, in a very particular moment, contemporary moment in time, uh, where we all experienced this um, visual social media data explosion. Um, I wanna move away from, from, from academia uh, to a little bit more recent work that I've done um, and, and, and in a different type uh, of esteemed community work. Um, this time in the context of a science and technology museum. Um, about, uh, I think five, six years ago, I joined uh, the Tech Museum of Innovation, uh, which is uh, the building, uh, the fortress that you see in the background here in the image. Uh, which is the, um, the largest cultural institution in Silicon Valley. Um, and I joined them to help them, uh, to try and help them integrate digital arts uh, into the museum activities. Now, uh, before we jump into the details, uh, or I show you some examples of what we did there, it's really important um, to go back to the question I started with, with the, which is the question of context. Um, and the context is crucial here because uh, it helps us to really understand what might be an impactful intervention uh, within the context of the text work, right? Um, within a particular location. So I, I would like to expand a little bit about uh, the socio-political and demographic context in Silicon Valley and the communities that we serve. So uh, I'm not sure how familiar all of you are with Silicon Valley, but uh, Counterintuitively to what you may think, the uh, achievement and educational opportunity gaps, right, between low income students and students of color to so their more advantaged peers in the Bay Area is wider than anywhere else in the state. And the, the reasons are obvious, but I will just outline them very briefly. Uh, top income earners in the Bay Area are more than 12 times uh, than those in the bottom of the economic ladder. Um, on the other side of this equation, you have the tech sector, 
um, and the image behind me is just for illustration, but it, it does represent uh, a specific uh, um, diversity issues in uh, Slack in a particular point in time that was taken a few years ago. Um, so you have, you know, in the tech sector, you have deep issues with diversity, as I mentioned, both in terms of personnel. Uh, only 26% of technology-related positions are held by women. And the situation is even worse for, obviously, for women of color with Black, Latina, and, and, and Native American women only taking uh, up to 4% uh, of roles in the computing workforce. Um, and you can see these gaps also in terms of the technology development process itself, right? Which is heavily being geared towards white male um, and designed by and for men, uh, which perpetuate this gap, right? And, 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 and the most famous example in this case is actually virtual reality uh, devices that were developed by men, right? And it was initially only tested on men uh, and created a whole set of problems for female users. Uh, so this is a, we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, maybe in the Q&A, but it's an interesting uh, example. Um, so going back to the tech, the tech museum's mission is to really minimize these uh, opportunity gaps by serving young people in the area. And over 50% of these visitors, of its visitors, come from low-income backgrounds. Uh, and they do these service communities uh, through hands-on interactive exhibits around technology-related issues, such as the environment, biology, security, et cetera. So the question that we asked um, uh, when I joined was, how do we bring all of these different communities together and address these complexities, uh, very particular complexities uh, in Silicon Valley uh, through the arts, right? And to do so, we opened an R&D lab, a research and development lab, and an exhibit gallery. Uh, again, the R&D lab and its power was part of the exhibit gallery on the museum floor was available to uh, the visitors uh, to the museum. And we focused on immersive tech. It was boom booming back at the time. Um, this discussion about virtual reality, human reality was sort of like the first, uh, first wave of, of investment, uh, major investment um, uh, by corporates in this, uh, uh, not new, but uh, 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 this technology. Um, and what we did in this research lab and exhibit gallery was to really facilitate creative collaborations with tech companies from Silicon Valley, researchers from major research institutions and global artists. So for example, as you can see in the slide behind me, um, we had major tech companies using the museum floor as a test bed for new experiences uh, that haven't been released to the public yet. Now the companies would showcase their technological experiences in virtual reality, women in reality, um, and collect user feedback uh, together with the museum visitors. Um, and that was revolutionary because what we were doing is trying to burst this UX user research bubble by collecting feedback from users, from people who are not typically included in uh, the development cycle, in this uh, technological development cycle that these companies run. Um, to really expand uh, uh, the pool of people uh, that they bring into the table in the development process. Now, very similarly, we worked with major uh, um, research, research institutions such as Stanford uh, in this case, um, which also suffer in the Bay Area from a diversity problem. Um, and they were running experiments on the museum floor with visitors focusing on generating empathy uh, with virtual uh, and augmented reality. But the main focus of the lab, uh, and also maybe the main focus of, the, of our session today is uh, facilitating collaborations between artists and tech companies um, that provided access to emerging technologies and technical support, right? So they would provide artists with the newest tech in development would guide them how to, uh, to use it. And the artist in return created these uh, interactive experiential um, uh, experiences for the museum visitors. Uh, so one of the most successful collaborative projects we worked on uh, is called Animaker. Uh, Animaker is an immersive exhibit that really invites people to uh, build uh, their favorite animal using Lego bricks. 
again, we're talking about the tech museum serving young people. Um, so we invited them to, be, to just choose their favorite animal, build it uh, in Lego bricks, and then walk with an AI powered robot to bring their creation to life. So let's uh, watch a short clip to give you a better sense of what that looks like. We've brought together an international team of artists, engineers, and educators to explore the way artificial intelligence can change the way we play and create. The result is Animaker, a new immersive experience that invites visitors to collaborate with AI-powered robots and bring their creations to life. Oh, it's an eagle! Resonite is an AI startup that brings visual perception to machines, the ability to understand the environment. At the core of this exhibit is our visual search engine that understands the precise geometry and structure of 3D content. In this exhibit, visitors can experience the new possibilities of human-machine interaction. The visitor builds an animal, and the machine can understand their creation based on its shape. When a visitor picks an animal to build, we present them with different artistic representations of that animal. This inspires the visitor to think, what is the essence of that animal? What are the unique features that define it? There's a combination of AI technology and creativity that I don't think you'll find in any other exhibit. With Animaker, we're creating a completely new play experience that extends the physical world into the virtual space. So just um, um, a brief note, just to say that, you know, this, um, uh, I think, an incredible collaboration and the end result was fantastic, um, um, really enabled um, uh, uh, incredible, incredibly diverse communities of Silicon Valley, most of whom um, not having, uh, uh, not ha have nothing to do with the tech industry. Uh, it's important to realize that to really engage with artistic ways of thinking and creating, while also getting exposed to um, cutting-edge technology coming from local industry uh, in a way that was accessible and easy. And that is exactly the mission of the organization. Now. Let's move from um, a large cultural institution uh, that only a small portion of it, right, was dedicated to the integration of art and tech uh, to an organization that this is its entire focus, uh, which is also my current engagement, uh, Gray Area Foundation for the Arts. Uh, we call it Gray Area. Um, and in a nutshell, uh, Gray Area, uh, which is uh, located in the Mission District in normal days, in the Mission District in San Francisco, um, is a cultural hub. Um, and we really try to bridge the fields of art and technology. Um, as many of you practice as well, we are involved in a wide range of collaborative activities that are often referred to uh, as inter, multi, trans, or even antidisciplinary. Um, um, and basically what all these terms reiterate, right? is the common practice of collaboration. We work with collaborators in different disciplines uh, as part of all of our ongoing events and festivals, um, um, education program, um, and incubator, uh, which are our main three focus areas, which I will talk more about in a second. But similar to my example before, um, this type of community work at Gray Area is in, um, we are involved with, right? Um, and its specific community impact can only be discussed again in context. Um, the last decade um, has been a time of really rapid change in the Mission District and in San Francisco. Um, um, as you know, uh, as Silicon Valley, it, it's it's uh, it's tricky to understand for people who are not who don't live here. But as Silicon Valley, which is actually 50 kilometers south of San Francisco, uh, suburban uh, and separate from, uh, from urban San Francisco. Uh, it really moved into the city about six, seven years ago um, and brought their well-paid workers with them, right? 
causing a cascade of gentrification, rising rents, rent, rising rents and displacement of all communities from the city. Uh, and one of the most famous examples of this tension um, between the old and new communities and newcomers are uh, uh, the private shuttle buses that run, are run by companies such as Google and Facebook to mobilize their employees between old Silicon Valley and San Francisco. Um, and have really driven up rents in areas near their bus stops, right? Because everyone wants to live there. And as a result, as you can see in these pictures from 2014, so it's been uh, a while ago and has been continuing since, uh, ongoing protests from locals uh, in the area said no to what they called tech exploitation, right? And blocked buses with, you know, uh, burnt scooters, which is another symbol of uh, uh, a tech culture in San Francisco occupying public spaces. Um, so in this very complex uh, 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 clash of cultures or communities, how do you intervene? How do we intervene? Uh, um, and how do you use the arts as a mitigator between uh, marginalized communities and new tech industries, new tech companies to the city? We'll talk more about it in the q and I'm sure. Um, but I want to give you a sense of how we did it, what Gray Area uh, uh, has done uh, in the area. We are located, located in the heart of the Mission District, uh, which was the center of this uh, uh, cultural clash uh, between tech um, and, and all communities, all residents, all residents in San Francisco. So we moved uh, in 2014, we moved into the Grand Theater, uh, which is a historic landmark that was built in 1940s and operated as a single single screen, single uh, screen cinema until the late 80s. Since then, it was a $1 store. Uh, and we took over um, and renovated the space and really turned it into a living cultural hub. Um, and I'm not just saying that, uh, for, for the creative community, local historic community, marginalized communities in the neighborhood at the more recent tech residents all working together towards uh, collaborating, creating uh, positive change through collaboration, through bringing art and tech. Um, and here is a short clip we created a few years ago uh, as part of our renovation efforts uh, of the theater, just to give you a sense of what the space looks like, again, in normal days. Um, let's take a look. So now that you get a sense of what the space looks like, and again, this was from a few years back, um, and a lot has changed. One of the most significant processes uh, we are proud of, uh, and we were able to develop through our programs, uh, events, education, incubation, um, is uh, uh, an engagement model that really creates a positive feedback loop from audience inspiration to community leadership, a full cycle of participations, right? And you can see here in the slide, our public events programming really draws audiences into our year-round education offering. Uh, and then, then their projects can enter into our incubator to, to refine and scale. Um, um, and then you, know, uh, you can use our space to, to, uh, to showcase your work, right? You, so you go into our education program, you learn uh, uh, creative inquiry, critical thinking, and practical skills to develop your projects. Um, if you want to learn more and you want to um, um, work with our com interdisciplinary community that work from our incubator space in the theater, you join the incubator, you get 
peer support to develop your projects. And what we emphasize is um, um, active participation with the community through exhibitions. So you can go through incubator and education programs and present your work in group showcases uh, in publics, public and available uh, 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 exhibitions uh, on the museum floor, which in turn turn you into a community leader, right? An educator, you can join, uh, uh, you can you, you join the community. Um, you you go through a full cycle by inspiring the community, um, starting the whole process uh, um, again and again and again. So it really is a regenerative cultural model that uh, we emphasize uh, with our community members. Um, now to give you a sense of what this uh, regenerative cultural model looks like, um, especially during the last year and a half uh, since COVID forced all of us uh, to shut down for over, you know, to shut down and close the theater, which so we couldn't do our normal work uh, from the Mission District. I'd like to actually briefly show you a year long project uh, we collaborated on with the Goethe Institute in San Francisco, uh, where we explored issues of technology mediated biases. Um, the program included speaker series uh, that explored uh, questions uh, about embedded biases in photography, data visualization, AI, for example. Again, this inspirational uh, component of our cycle. Um, but we also had uh, an open call for augmented reality works that critically engage with the topic. Now, we did the open call um, by partnering with an AR startup called Artivide. Uh, and actually a European uh, um, um, AR startup. And we offered five global workshops, uh, hands-on workshop for participants from all over the world. So we had workshops in Beijing, in Montreal, in LA, uh, and a few other places uh, where we guided um, participants uh, through different ways to reflect on the issue through um, using augmented reality. Um, we received, uh, hundreds of submissions really, uh, and presented the works in an online gallery uh, where you can point, point your phone towards any work uh, to activate their AR, AR layer. Um, and I will share the link uh, to the gallery uh, after the call, after the talk. Um, I'd like to share one of the submitted works uh, called Ecology of Worries by Caitlin Foley and Misha Rabinovich, which is on the left here. Um, Coming after a year full of stress and worry for everyone uh, in the world, really, um, the work asks the question of whether we should teach a machine to worry for us. Wouldn't that be convenient? Or if machine can really hear us and support us. Um, they created a set of odd creatures. As you can see here, this is just one example. Um, and then animated them uh, with endless worries that were generated using machine learning. Uh, GPT actually, um, and are based on an archive of actual recorded worries uh, that the artists have been collecting since 2016. Uh, so this is what it looks like when you point your phone towards the image. I'm worried my house will break down and I won't be able to make any money. I'm worried my brother will die. I'm worried my mother won't be able to find some money. I'm worried my friends will be jealous. I'm worried my boyfriend will be sad. I'm worried my husband will be jealous. I'm worried my partner will be jealous. I'm worried my family will be jealous. I'm worried my children will be jealous. I'm worried my cat will not be jealous. I'm worried my house will break down and I won't be able to make any money. I'm worried my brother. Okay, so just to give you a, a sense of the work, uh, and it has uh, multiple uh, of these, um, odd creatures that you can activate using your phone. Uh, I think it's an interesting work uh, speaking about STEAM communities, uh, since it's once again uh, brings up the possibility to um, elicit empathy through uh, creativity and technology. And this is a major role uh, STEAM collaborations can and, and should play, in my opinion, through community work. Um, and with this, uh, I will end and, and uh, open it up for questions. So thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, Nadav. Um, really 
kind of visually stunning and uh, inspiring set of set of projects there. And um, you know, from your time also uh, before Grey Area. And um, but just before I, I I wanted to kind of ask a question, uh, kind of on that. And um, in the meantime, if if any attendee does have any kind of questions, do feel free to kind of put it in the Q&A and I'll be able to kind of read it out uh, for you. But in the meantime, I, I kind of wanted to kind of go back to Grey Area and, and you, you talked about the mission, the kind of area in particular and how it's, how it's gone through a, a very rapid phase of gentrification. And the, the challenges are there, very, very visceral, very visible for everyone. And what was what? What do you think the role of the grey area is as a as an organisation to respond to this phenomenon, um, or what responsibility do you think it should have, and and also what responsibility should the citizen the citizens of the city have uh, to respond to that? Yeah, I mean it's an ongoing question. Uh, thank you for this. Um, and the change the answers to this question change. Um, more frequently than you think, you may think. I mean, we just went through a year and a half, more than uh, more than a year and a half of uh, of a shutdown. Um, and what it means that we were not in the community, we were not working with the community for for a long time. And the needs of the community, uh, the space, uh, the physical space, has changed. Um, so let's you know, let's take a moment to think about it when we all hopefully uh, going back uh, into uh, normal days, at least we reopened the area about uh, two weeks ago with small scale exhibitions. We, and we are starting to uh, receive or, or, or uh, accommodate visitors from the community um, all over again. But the citizens, the, the residents, the community is different, the, 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 the place is different. Uh, and we will have to learn um, how to uh, how to respond to these new needs, which are different. So that's on a very uh, uh, um, uh, concrete. It's, an, it's another context, right? We we can't really generalize uh, with these type of questions. We have to really respond to the needs. Uh, but if we do want to generalize, which you know um, sometimes it's much easier than actually uh, uh, responding to. Um, 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 specific situations, I can say, you know, the role of gray area um, specifically uh, can fall into a few categories. One of them is representation, right? Uh, we are talking about, uh, um, uh, we're doing events, uh, research projects, uh, um, education, large education programs. We actively uh, um, monitor uh, um, and accommodate uh, marginalized communities both in, uh, you know, on the participant side sides and on the speakers, the instructor side. Um, and over 70% of both of them come from marginalized communities and it can be LGBTQ, it can be women, it can be people of color um, um, and so on and so forth. We really emphasize uh, um, um, incorporating marginalized voices uh, as part of our programming. And this is crucial. And, uh, um, especially crucial in, in the Mission District in San Francisco, uh, which is so dominated by, by uh, white, uh, white male tech workers, right? And the other, you know, the, the other aspect of it is access, right? Uh, we work towards providing uh, um, um, access to training, right? To, to, to teach people about how to use technology for creative services, for creative outlets, right? Uh, we also provide our space. In normal days, we provide, provide our space to other nonprofits in the area to walk from, uh, from the theater, right? You have to understand that uh, um, in the Bay Area, um, physical space is a very rare commodity. It's extremely, extremely expensive. Um, and most nonprofits are not able, no, not, you know, they, don't afford, they can't afford to have their physical space. So we really provide them the space either for free or for uh, uh, subsidized uh, uh, subsidized fees so they can walk from, from our location and serve their communities. Um, and in terms of participation, we usually offer, uh, we always offer scholarships uh, for whoever cannot uh, uh, pay the fees that we, uh, that we request for educational and, and events. 
um, just to expand the range of people that uh, can uh, visit uh, and participate in our programs. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. I can, I can mention also uh, uh, facilitation of meaningful connections, which is uh, what we try to do in all of our events, all of our programs, right? To bring these different communities to use the arts as a mitigator between uh, uh, marginalized communities, the tech communities, uh, and the creative community, this triangle of, uh, of, of, of different, often uh, siloed uh, groups. Um, so, you know, I, I would end here, but the list is really, um, the, uh, there are so many opportunities um, uh, to serve the community in the context of San Francisco, in the context of the Mission District. And just to, to wrap up your question, you asked about the citizens. Well, the citizens role is to um, um, try and participate, right? Uh, uh, fight the fight, uh, uh, voice their needs, voice out their needs. So uh, they are being heard. Um, and as you could see, uh, uh, there is a lot of civic participation, uh, specifically in the Bay Area, um, because of the nature of the, um, the debates here. Um, so the example that I brought with the demonstrations really, uh, it's not a one-time thing, it's an ongoing uh, discussions. More, most recently and most famously, you can think about the BLM movement, um, uh, which took a very prominent role in the Bay Area. Um, so um, endless opportunities for participation. <laughs>